Happy Valentine's Day. It's us, the Hi, Walshes. There's, there's my wife, Julia, who uh, um, behind the scenes you guys have communicated quite a bit with, and she's going to be helping out with today's lecture. And, and also we're just celebrating Valentine's Day together, which is awesome. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we had a primer uh, in the biology of aging, and uh, it was really important to, uh, contextually to look at the biology of aging. I know you guys are not biologists, because we're going to launch into the big three diseases um, that will impact all of you in one way or another, either uh, directly uh, as you get older, uh, sometimes um, when you're young too, and then uh, your parents and your grandparents. These big three are cancer, uh, diabetes, and heart disease. We're linking them together, and, um, and then Alzheimer's disease. Alrighty, and uh, so um, yeah, we're going to get into cancer in a second, um, but uh, just a, a reminder here, I'm coming over here, we have a reiteration on the left panel on Blackboard um, of the syllabus, and uh, we see February 24th, that's uh, CT1's coming up, okay, so uh, uh, you need to, to get that together, many, many of you have already done it, and that's good, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to go directly into our weekly assignments, so I'm going to click there. Alrighty, and we're going to go into, so we, we had the primer on, um, on problems in terms of DNA repair, okay, in terms of um, a driver of cell division, that was IGF-1, those are all the theories, and that was the, the hormonal and nutritional theory, and now we're going into cancer. Alrighty, do you want to take the lead on this? I will. All right. Okay, so I am the poster child for cancer because I am a cancer patient. I was diagnosed in 2013 with leukemia. And at the time I was diagnosed, the prognosis was not very good. Um, and yet here I am <laughs> doing good, doing great uh, many years later. And I have reaped the benefit of um, rapid advances in treatment and access to really good health care. Um, we have the luxury in Southern California to be surrounded by major medical centers that, um, you know, of course, each medical center may specialize in a different type of cancer, but um, I'm able to go to a, a large medical center and get the latest and greatest treatment. I participated in a clinical trial, and because of that, I'm doing really well today. Mm-hmm. So um, whenever we talk about cancer, I always ask John if I can sit in because it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, as a cancer patient, as an advocate for cancer patients. And um, a lot of you, you know, statistics show that one out of two or one out of every three um, people in the U.S. will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. So a lot of you are going to be affected by cancer either personally or through a loved one. And, um, you know, I think one of the take-home messages we want you to um, get is that although this is a scary disease and if you're dealing with it or if a family member is dealing with it, it's, it's hard. Um, we have amazing research, amazing new treatments. We're seeing rapid advances with things like lung cancer and, and advanced melanoma due to new medications. And so the statistics are changing and improving all the time. And we're going to go over the statistics um, as it applies, of course. I I do want to backtrack. um, Her treatment for a clinical trial was at UC San Diego Morris Cancer Center. And um, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and pass along a link to a really cool article. She talked about um, what it's like to be in a clinical trial, why it's so important. You know, so it's people that do clinical (laughs) trials are heroes. All right. Uh, Just like we have people that did the clinical trials for the um, COVID-19 vaccines. Um, they're heroes because, you know, you are, um, you know, a quote unquote guinea pig where you're putting your body out there being test testing a novel treatment that will hopefully protect you and make your life better. And her, her cancer treatment did. But also then everybody that um, that gets cancer in the future benefits from the knowledge gained from her clinical trial. Same thing can be said about uh, COVID-19. Okie dokie. And so um When we talk about cancer statistics, they are changing all the time. So um, when you're answering the quiz questions this week, I want you to focus on the charts and graphs that we have included in the reading because there's more recent statistics all the time coming out. Um, So if you if you get confused, email me, let me know if you don't understand a question, let me know where we I always tell people we are not deliberately trying to trick anyone with our quiz questions. 
sometimes we inadvertently trick you and, <laughs> because you know right. and don't forget the, not know, clear. <laughs> I always say this every time. Right now, if if you know, first of all, you should just kick kick back and enjoy this this wonderful lecture by this incredible loving couple on during Valentine's Day. <laughs> but but also, um, <laughs> you you should when you're doing the quiz. Um, as you're going through the course material, open the quiz at the same time. And then you, you look at your question and then you see where the answer is within the material that we have. Okay? And when a lot of the quiz questions, I've tried to give you hints. So I'll say we're looking at statistics from a certain date to a certain date. So go and find the graph that has those dates on it. So, you know, right. we're trying to give you hints here. And now. these very same quiz questions will show up here. Um, in the midterm. Now we have, we're drawing from large pools. So those of those you guys that have been working together, and it's okay to work together, by the way, as you've been working together, you've been um, seeing, hey, my quiz questions are different than yours. And, and that's okay. So um, this is the newer report that Julia was talking about right here. So if you click on this, they can, it that'll brings, take you to the 2020 report. Right, and, right. So, and so we um, always have it there to update, but here's what we're, we're looking at right looking now. At now. So in general, we're seeing, um, declines in cancer rates and, and, and generally improval in survival rates due to new treatments, um, better access to health care. That isn't true across the board, and we'll talk about some reasons why that might be the case. We are seeing increases, especially in younger people, um, of cancers related to being overweight and being inactive. So there's a lot you can do to manage your cancer risk, either the risk of getting cancer or the risk of having a bad outcome if you get cancer. So eating healthy food, getting exercise, um, moderate um, or no alcohol consumption. Mm -hmm. um, all the good stuff. All the good stuff makes you get cancer, which right. is a shame. Right. Um, so those are the kind of things, you know, being active, being healthy. We know that that will reduce your risk of cancer over your lifetime. You, know, you, you can have a genetic predisposition and you, you can't control. There's things you can't control in life, but there's, a, there's things you do can't control in terms of all your diseases. You know, you guys want to be like us. You know, we just came back from this. Well, you do. Other than her leukemia, which sucks, you know. But, um, but you know, we were very active. You know, we went for a three-mile three walk earlier. We go for mile, five-mile walks all the time. I still surf, you know. Julie does yoga, and she's brilliant, you know, compared to, you know, the only thing that's problem with me is, is sometimes what's up here is <laughs> suspect, okay. But, um. But yeah, you, you want to you want to you know do everything you can under control, and that's what this is about right here. Okay. All right. The other thing that you can do, I want to give a shout out during the COVID pandemic. One of the concerns that public health people have is that um, people aren't going to get cancer screening because they're afraid. And that is, you know, I've missed my mammogram this year, and that's something I never miss. And so as soon as it's safer for me, I'm going to go get my mammogram, get my annual exam, get my pap smear, do all the things that I need to do. Um, and, you know, I'm due for a colonoscopy in the fall. But making sure that we're staying on top of our mm -hmm. cancer screenings that can catch cancer at an early stage. Mm -hmm. The reason I haven't done it is that I'm at very high risk because of my leukemia if I am infected with COVID. Right. So you guys um, understand the leukemia means that's a cancer of your immune system. And it's your immune system that will attack COVID-19, that will attack the SARS-CoV-2 virus and eliminate it. So you can tell, I mean, we're in, yeah, we've been in lockdown. <laughs> you can tell them. The I'm very are... careful. I am very careful. Um, I only leave the house to walk my dog. I haven't been anywhere except for my medical appointments that are essential. Always um, wear a mask. My statistics for people with my diagnosis, there is a 35% mortality rate if I get um, COVID-19. So I don't want to get COVID-19. And I'm very much looking forward to getting the vaccine. Now, other things you can do to prevent or reduce your risk of cancer um, the HPV vaccine. I am a fan, and I know vaccines are controversial. Not everyone feels good about vaccines in general. I am a fan of the HPV vaccine. We are seeing amazing data coming out of Australia. Australia, when you look at it, is a country very similar to the United States in terms of the makeup of the population and cancer risk. But they have one of the lowest cervical cancer rates in the world because they implemented a very widespread um, vaccination program for HPV. Now, HPV can cause cervical cancer, but it can also cause throat cancer, anal cancer, lots of different types of bad cancers. So we know, um, just in, in our small circle of friends, we know two young women who've been diagnosed with cervical cancer um, and two men who've been diagnosed with um, HPV-related cancers. So, oh, throat cancer. Yeah, yeah, because I'm a cancer patient, 
Um, I am a fan of, hey, if you can get a vaccine that prevents cancer, let's do it. So you're eligible to get or encouraged to get um, the HPV vaccine up to the age of 26. Now, I wrote down some numbers to give you a little scare. Half of the people in the U.S. between 18 and 49 are infected with genital HPV. 80% will be infected in their lifetime. So it doesn't matter who you are. If you leave your house, at some point in your life, you're going to be exposed to HPV. Um, and that's that's the stat. Especially if you like, <laughs> especially if you like to have sex or anything. You know, you, I'm <laughs> saying you leave your house, you're going to get exposed. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so that's my little commercial for cancer screening and cancer vaccinations, um, which is an exciting new thing that we may have in the future for more types of cancer. So, um, let's scroll down. Okay. Um, <laughs> Excuse me for a second. Oh, he's too gone. I, I, I'm just, well, okay, I, bye. I like, I like visual aids. Okay, bye. I'm right here. No. Um, so we have a huge avocado tree in our backyard. Yes, we do. This is one of the things, omega-3 fatty acids, baby. To eat healthy, you're going to reduce your cancer risk. We're eating a lot of avocado toast, yeah. avocados, avocados and we, salads. We're gonna, we're gonna, we got one tree, about 700 avocados. Yes. So we've so been handing them out. I've been handing them out to you yes. if there wasn't a pandemic. Next year. Next yeah. year. Stop by around this time of year. We'll have avocados in the uh, in the Walsh office in the gerontology. So um, when you go through your quiz questions, you're going to see questions like, you know, what's the, the deadliest cancer type for men and women? Um, you'll see uh, what are the most common cancer types. So when you're looking at those quiz questions, are we asking you for um, death rates? Are we asking you for incidence rates? Pay attention to that as you answer the, the, the questions. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about real quickly is, uh, sorry, I'm whizzing through this pretty fast. Right. I wanted to talk. So those were de death rates and incidence rates right there. Just okay. look at the titles on the graphs. We see pretty good survival rates for cancers among children. Um, and one of the reasons for that, I believe, is that uh, children who are diagnosed with cancer enroll in clinical trials at a very high rate. So the research advances more rapidly. you can see rapidly. that right here. They're, they're very vulnerable because uh, early out of the out of the blocks, you're, you're forming a lot of immune system cells. They're, they're very vulnerable to all these different forms of immune system uh, Blood cancers. cancers. And they used, yeah. to be, they used to be a death sentence. That was yeah. the reality. This, you know, maybe there was like, you know, a five, 10 percent survival rate back in the 60s and 70s. And this is where we're at now. Yeah. But we have very good treatments. The treatment mm -hmm. that I had was a non-chemotherapy right. treatment that was a targeted um, oral pill with an IV infusion. Very well, very yeah. easy to tolerate. I continued working. It was yeah. fine. It was antibodies. Um, for those of yeah. you that have antibody treatment for autoimmune disease, it was antibody of the same kind of uh, approach. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about differences in um, and sorry, <laughs> and survival rates um, for cancers, when you contrast um, white patients, black patients, and there's data on you know white, black, um, American Indian, Asian, Hispanic, et cetera. Um, so we see differences in survival rates, which can be possibly attributed to access to healthcare, um, health, good health insurance, socioeconomic levels, um, uh, trust in the medical system. Um, so there's a lot of different societal factors that can go into, into these differences. Um, but, you know, when you see, for example, in melanoma, um, there's a huge difference between survival in white people and survival in black patients. And, um, and so that's something, if I'm a public health person, I'm going to start educating my black patients about what to look for. I'm going to start educating doctors. How do you diagnose melanoma in people of color? So there's a lot that can be improved in the medical system. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that can be improved in terms of educating the patient right. population. You'll see a, a difference between that, like just when you're diagnosed, um, um, and your survival rate. So there's a pretty uh, prostate cancer, a pretty similar survival rate. However, a lot of um, African American um, men do not get checked, and so their death rate actually can be higher. Yes, you know? if you're again, if you're diagnosed with cancer at a more advanced stage, that usually leads to a worse outcome. Yeah. And we have a great person in gerontology, um, Reginald Tucker Seeley, who has devoted his career to studying differences in and um, in cancer survival rates and access to health care and, and racial disparities and racial disparities. Right. So anyway, so take a look through this and, right. and realize that there is still, even though we've made strides in this area, there is still a noticeable difference in terms of survival. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, we've got more data 
uh, looking now it's broken down white, black, Asian Pacific Islander, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Hispanic. Um, and sometimes people do well. I mean, it looks to me like if you're looking at lung cancer, that um, Asians and Pacific Islanders do better. So that's a good thing. Now we need to study that population. What are they doing better? Is it their, is it their diet? Is it their access to health care? Are they compliant with what the doctors tell them to do? So what's special? What, how, why do they do better? And these are all um, questions that people are vigorously researching and trying to figure out how can we um, even the playing field when it comes to cancer patients. And that's something I'm very passionate about. So this, this is the point I was talking about right here. You, look, you compare the death rate, white versus black here. And, and, you know, first of all, you know, women go see their OBGYN. They, they have more regular uh, a regular connection with healthcare than men do. Men tend to mm, macho, tough it out, you know. And then and then you have to ask, you know, what what is the cultural difference here? Why, you know, why is this, you know, there's a, a 20% uh, increase in death rate compared to white versus black patients. Alrighty, and this is data from the U.S. Um, so if we expanded and looked at world data, um, for example, cervical cancer, um, some of the highest rates that we see are in Africa um, because they don't do routine cervical cancer screening. So um, there's there's things that you need to think about from a public health standpoint. If you roll out the HPV vaccine in, in Africa, you also need to roll out a cervical cancer screen in Africa so that people are getting checked, you know, more than just never. <laughs> and, then, and there are ton, tons of cancers. Okay, I, I just wanted, I, I opened this thing, uh, this website right here. I just actually Googled, let's say, you know, uh, total number of cancer types. And, um, you know, it est estimated, you know, um, more than 120 different types of cancers. And um, I thought, you know, the, the, it, I was like, oh, I'm going to take a look at the image because I'm an image guy. So I clicked images um, right here. And lo and behold, look what's the first thing that popped up, our world in data, baby. So uh, this is, you know, totally just, again, shows you how this website that we've, you know, put out there for you um, uh, in terms of, you know, your CT1 it's, it's incredible. So it's a great resource. All right. Maybe. Cool. Cool. All right. So you continue on. Okay. So we are seeing sur uh, improvements in survival rates and it's always a look back thing. So it's kind of like the, you're driving a bus down the road and the person is looking out the back of the bus to see what happened in the past um, to measure survival rates because yeah, I... 75 to 2012. Yeah. So I was diagnosed in 2013. I had probably a 50-50 chance of making it five years. So cancer um, statistics people like to look at that five-year survival rate and the one-year survival rate for really um, bad cancers. And so I had about a 50-50 chance of making it to 2018. So it's 2021. Even in the pandemic and all the crazy stuff that we've had to deal with, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm excited. With the new treatments, I could have potentially a normal lifespan. So when you get diagnosed with cancer, when your friend gets diagnosed with cancer, when your loved one gets diagnosed with cancer, do not think it's all gloom and doom. You've got to educate yourself, learn about the disease, and be able to advocate um, for yourself and for your loved ones. And, and she commented earlier how it, it's going to affect you either directly or you know indirectly through through being a loved one, you know, caregiver. For me, um, you know, I kind of had to redirect. I had to wrap my head around it, you know, because um, uh, I went through this whole, we're going to talk about um, the grief process because, oh, my God, I, you know, I could lose my wife. But also then I had to wrap my head around it. And I had the luxury of my career. I, had, I redirected uh, my time. And I said, OK, I'm going to go to every single infusion. I'm going to every single doctor's visit. You know, and uh, because that was important to me as a caregiver. <laughs> <laughs> it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> So he has been to every appointment, and now that they don't allow him in the building while I get my infusions, he sits in the parking lot. For three which hours. Is, which is so sad. Okay. But you know what, I, what we do is sometimes she gets a window seat, and then I'll go around, and um, and I uh, will talk on our iPhone. So I'll go in there, and I just call her, and then we just sit there through the window and talk. And he does so. a full comedy routine, which <laughs> probably doesn't surprise any of you. Okay, so did we cover pretty much? Are we, yeah. we have the video. Yeah, and these are just... Um, Again, the definitions. So just that's we can't go through everything. You guys could look at that. That's a really good report on the other one. They go through the different types of cancers that they go behind this concept. Okay. And there is two major gene types, all affected by viruses, 
if you're unlucky, the HPV virus we were talking about, okay, it could be the hep C virus in terms of liver cancer, affected by environmental hazards, okay? So there are mutagens out there. We've heard about asbestos and um, and um, there are carcinogens often in, in lots and lots of different products. Um, and then there are the genes, and these are the two types of genes that get impacted. And people with the quiz questions, get confused. And that's why we added this graphic to the bottom of the reading. So if you have a normal proto-oncogene, then it gets mutated, something gets deleted, something gets mutated, and then it turns into an oncogene. And then that kind of feeds the cancer and makes the cancer growth and everything just take off. Your tumor suppressor cells, like that's TP53, right? right, right. So TP53 elephants have like, I don't know, 150 copies. They have a, a bunch of copies. They don't get cancer. Um, when you have um, uh, a person with a tumor suppressor gene like TP53 and it gets mutated, then that person gets cancer. So it's the mutated gene that, that causes it to not behave appropriately and not do what it would normally do in its normal circumstances of suppressing the, the, the tumor development. And, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, unfortunate vocabulary, but um, you hear, oh, I have a proto -oncogene. No, it, it's a I mean, I wish they didn't use that term. These are just there. There are normal genes. There are normal genes that that allow us to grow. So, so um, you know, when, when you eat a meal, um, the the the, the um, resources come in. You know, whatever it is, glucose or amino acids, and it comes in, and then you release hormones that 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 become drivers for making new cells. So you make new cells, okay? And um, so, you know, I, every every 20 days, you make new red blood cells. You know, every couple days, you make new skin cells. So, you, and, and it's these, these growth genes that are the gas, you know, foot, the, um, the, your foot on the gas pedal that, um, that, is, that is saying, let's make new cells. Those are the proto-oncogenes, okay? However, when they um, undergo a mutation, so in, in instead of making... Uh, new skin cells every um, every couple of days. You're making new skin cells every second. That's not normal, okay? And that's a mutated foot on the gas pedal. The P, uh, Julie mentioned the the, the uh, p53 gene. That it, it is a suppressor gene. What it does is it goes in and it finds these mutations, okay? And it says, uh oh, we need to repair that DNA. So it's in there. It's a it's a collection of genes that are called DNA repair genes. So, because you're getting, believe it or not, you're getting mutations in your genes all the, t all the time, all the time, okay? And these, D there's a family of them. The BRCA gene for, for breast cancer is another DNA repair gene, another tumor suppressor gene. It will go in there and do its best to get rid of these mutations so that you have, um, again, normal patterns of growth. However, um, if they, uh, the number of mutations are sky high, then those those same genes, these tumor suppressor genes, go into a special um, process and tell the cell that's it, and they kill you off. It's called apoptosis. So there, I couldn't okay. help it. I'm a biologist. Thanks. Okay. okay, awesome. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about death and dying. The classic um, study of death and dying is uh, Kubler Ross, and everyone's familiar with um, the DABDA concept, denial, anger, bargaining, despair, acceptance. When you go through grieving, you may not go linearly through Kubler Ross's process, and your, and your grief may not look anything like that. So this is just one way of thinking about grief that I think is helpful for people, and it's very common to go through a phase and go back to the prior phase. So you may be in denial, you may go to anger, you may go to bargaining, you may go back to denial again, and you may bounce around. And this can go on for a long period of time. I lost my mom um, suddenly two years ago, and she was a very vital, energetic person and, and died suddenly of a heart attack. We were super, super close. And this was a tragedy, just, just very, very hard um, for me to process. And it gave me a lot of empathy for other people that are going through grief and um, and so, you know, this is something that I think really helped me. Um, but there's also a website out there called What's Your Grief that deals with a hundred different types of grief. You can have grief because someone's died. You can have grief because someone is unavailable, whether you've broken up, you've ended a relationship or maybe yeah, you can have a shitty boyfriend <laughs> and, and that's it. You and know? you grieve the loss of the relationship. 
Maybe the person's unavailable because they have mental health issues, or maybe they're an addict, or maybe they're, you know, there's just some reason why they're not available anymore. Um, you may have a relative that's sick or develops Alzheimer's, and you have kind of anticipatory grief because you can see the train coming down the tracks, and you know that this is going to get worse and, and worse. And we have COVID, that's really we hard. COVID nineteen grief. For we people, have, you know, yeah. people suddenly you can't hang out with friends. You know, yes. no, this may have changed for some of you, but you know, early on when everybody was scared, it was like oh, you know, all of a sudden you had you know the handcuffs put around yeah. you. Yeah, you see, you know, we, and we put it here with respect to the three diseases that are most likely to cause death in, you know, in, you know, in our society, you know, in terms of historically, and this is what we're educating you on. But a lot of you probably have COVID-19 grief because somebody has died, you know, within your circle. So um, there is kind of a disclosure. Some people have trouble with this, right? Yeah. So, so if you have been impacted by death or loss or grief recently, and you are not comfortable participating in this discussion, that's okay. We understand that. I can give you an alternative assignment. So you can email me and, um, and then it'll be something on an unrelated topic that you can um, still get the credit for the discussion, but you don't have to go in there. Um, I do think we can learn a lot from each other. Um, speaking about loss and grief to each other. And it may be your pet that died. It may be, you know, finding out that you didn't get the job or the internship that you wanted. It may be, you know, a lot of different things, having a friendship and having a relationship and um, losing a grandparent. Um, my son's best friend when he was growing up passed away last year. And, and so we've, you know, we've had to process that. And a lot of you have been through some very tough things, losing young friends, um, which is very, very hard. Um, the one thing I can tell you, um, and this is the beauty of gerontology, is that as you get older, processing grief gets easier because you have more experience, sadly. <laughs> but you get better at acceptance. And um, for me, when my mom passed away, she loved to garden. So we created a garden kind of in her memory. I just recently ordered this necklace that has her handwriting on it. And she used to send us little cards and she would write love mom. And so I had this necklace engraved with love on it. And so every time I look at it, now it's been two years. So now when I look at it, I get a happy, warm feeling. If I'd done this a few months after she died, I would be sobbing uncontrollably and I wouldn't have been able to handle it. But so it gets easier as time goes on. And the more you love, the more you grieve when you lose someone. And it's okay. It's part of life. So, so love. It's happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. So let's, let, let's, you know, let's let's do this right during Valentine's Day. So do watch these videos. And um, it was great having my wife here today. <laughs> She'll be back. You can have, if you, if, you, um, if you take a look at the, you know, the, um, the upcoming topics, um, you will see that uh, we go back to weekly assignments here. We see that you're going to get a big old chunk of lawyering down here. Okay, so these three, one, two, and three are yeah, all. Yeah, we handle some legal lawyer. issues. Oh, look, yes. look, we have a visitor. That's what I, oh. I left for a while. Here, come here. Come here, Bella. Come here. Come on. Oh, she doesn't trust us. Yeah, she's up. <laughs> come on, babies. Come on, girls. Oh, oh. <laughs> all right. All right, come here. Come on, girl. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> you know how a dog just reads this? So this is Normally, when I'm on Zoom, when I'm teaching, she wants to be in my lap. There you go. Oh, look Dude. at who's the cutest baby girl in the world. She says, I am 12 years old. In a, in she's a, a gerontology dog. In about two weeks, she's going to be 12. Okay, you need to get out of here. She's a very good girl. She's a good girl. Everybody says like so. Forced to do anything. Yes, she didn't actually. When she squealed, it wasn't because she was hurt. It was because she didn't want to do what we were telling her. There she goes. <laughs> okay, we need to get out of here, guys. So, uh, okay. um, it's fun to have Valentine's Day. Enjoy it, and we'll see you next time.